1 Corinthians 6. Now, we'll get there in a minute, but what I think I'd like to do is just begin with a little personal testimony first. I think this is uh, important because if you're going to listen to this study, you're going to go through each of these uh, particular studies, you need to know that the guy that's speaking to you tonight and the one who wrote this is not uh, someone that's just talking a bunch of theory. Uh, I've lived the struggle, and I think it's important for you to, to have a little bit of my testimony. Uh, I began to, uh, to drink when I was 14 years old. And um, I lived, I grew up in a home where alcohol was uh, the nightly drug of choice. And I just uh, could never seem to drink just one drink. I would always drink to drunkenness. As I got into college, I added drugs to the, to the alcohol. Uh, I couldn't do that uh, either uh, with uh, any success. And then all of a sudden, Christ came into my life. I met Jesus Christ, and he transformed me and changed me. But even then, I thought to myself, well, you know, I can still have a little nightly glass of wine, and, and I, so I tried that. Tried rationalizing that, but that didn't work either because I could never just drink one drink. And so I finally came to the conclusion, I can't, I can't do this. Uh, I, have to, I have to put this off completely. And for the last 39 years, I have not had any alcohol, any drugs of any kind. And so I know that the Lord can set somebody free. And I've watched too many other people set free. And so I know it is truly possible. So just so that you know that I know, I had to share with you that personal testimony. So tonight, what I want to do is I want to address the issue of causes and solutions for the issue of addictions. And I think that that is a, a very important fundamental concept for any believer. They have to understand what causes their struggle and where the solution is found. And it, I think that this is essential. Now, of course, I'm talking about addictions or what we would call life-dominating habits. They, just, they are not just drugs and alcohol. Uh, a person can struggle with a life-dominating habit dealing with food, overeating. Uh, they can deal with the same issue in pornography, uh, gambling, all kinds of things. Any habit that controls you where you crave to do it, that is what an addiction is. And so the scripture is very clear about this particular truth, that this is how the scripture defines what an addiction is or what a life-dominating habit is. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 4, it says, Now the mixed multitude who were among them, among the children of Israel, it says, yielded to intense craving, so that the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? Now there is how the scripture defines what a life-dominating circumstance is all about. It says they yielded to intense cravings. And if you look at the dictionary definition of addiction, that's how it defines it. And so if you look at your own life, that's exactly the experience that we have all had. And so an addiction is just a behavior that controls you. It's a habit. It's an intense craving that you yield to. And when you do, it controls you. And yet, here in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12, Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, 
but I will not be brought under the power of any. I will not be brought under the power of any. And so when you realize that you are under the control of a substance or some behavior that controls you, that is what an addiction is. And that will hinder that individual from fulfilling that, the calling that God has upon their life. And so it is essential that we get from underneath the power that is controlling us and give the power to one individual, and that is the Lord Jesus. He is the only one who has the right to control me. So understanding that this is what an addiction is, let's look at the causes. What are the causes of your addictions? And why is it so important to understand what the causes are? I believe that this is essential. Now, if you simply deal with the symptoms of your struggles, you will never be free from them. You have to get at the cause. It's kind of like um, an issue where you go to the doctor, and if you went to the doctor and, and you said, Doc, I got a headache, and he said, uh, here, take two aspirin and see me in a month. But you had a brain tumor that was causing that headache. And you didn't know that. Well, would the two aspirin help? You took care of the symptom. You relieved the headache for the moment. But you haven't dealt with the cause. And it would be a fatal mistake. And I find that this is the same fatal mistake that people make over and over again, is they don't get at the causes. They don't recognize what those central causes are, which means that they will never really gain victory. They will have moments where the symptoms subside, but then they go right back again. Now, I've been pastoring for, gosh, 35 years, and I have seen a whole lot of folks get free and return again, get free and return again. And this is what brought me to this conclusion. They are not getting at the causes of these issues. Sometimes there are multiple causes. It's not just one single issue. And it's different for every single person. Now, there are some fundamental causes that are, uh, I think, uh, you know, very basic to all addictions. And those are the ones I'm going to cover tonight. But sometimes there are some individual issues that are specific just to you. Now, Jesus always wanted to get at the cause for any particular problem, any particular stumbling that took place in the disciples' lives. He would always ask them the why question. Now, this is an important thing to note in the Scripture. In Matthew 6.28, Jesus said to the disciples, Why do you worry? In Matthew 8, 26, he said, Why are you fearful? In Matthew 14, 31, he said, Why do you doubt? Now, why would he ask the why question? Because he's trying to get the disciples to reason through in their minds, Why are you fearful at this moment? Why are you doubting at this moment? Why is there worry in your heart? Because if you don't answer that question, that why question, then you, will, you don't know what to do about it. You don't know what to deal with. When Peter was asked, why are you doubting as he was sinking into the water? Well, what's Jesus trying to get at? Well, Peter told him exactly why he doubted. He said, well, Lord, I saw the waves. I heard the wind. So what was he doing? He was looking at the circumstances. So when a person looks at the circumstances about them and they focus on those circumstances and they believe the circumstances more than 
the word that called him forth to walk on the water. Then you're going to sink every single time. And so that's the reason why Jesus asked him that very important question. Why? So Jesus wanted his disciples to reason through these issues because the word why is asking for causes. Why? Do you know that in the scripture, well, in my version, 1,251 times, the scripture says, because. You should underline that because the Lord is telling you, this is the reason why I'm telling you to do this or that. It's because of this reason. Because. There is a cause for why you're doing what you're doing. And this is the reason. So these are issues that you have to consider. Now next, what are these causes of addictive behavior, of life-dominating habits? Well, the first and the most important cause is the spiritual vacuum and the emptiness inside of every single human soul. Now this is... I, I believe a fundamental, basic cause for every sin, every addictive behavior, every life-dominating habit, anything and everything that causes us to depart from him. It is this basic, fundamental problem with each and every one of us. We have a vacuum, a spiritual emptiness inside. Now, God says that man is empty, and he craves something to fill this emptiness. This is what the scripture declares. Let me read to you. In Isaiah 29, 8, it says there, God says, And it shall even be as when a hungry man dreams, and look, he eats. As he awakes and his soul is still empty. Notice that. His soul is still empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreams. And look, he drinks. But he awakes. And indeed his, he is faint. And his soul still craves. So the multitude of all the nations shall be who fight against Mount Zion. So the Lord says... All of the nations, all of the people that are fighting against his people will have a dream that they are going to eat and they are going to drink, but they will always end up empty, craving something more. Because of why? Because they're rebelling against the Lord. They are not following him. And this is the reason why they will always be faint or weak, this is the reason why they will always awaken and they'll still have this craving emptiness inside. And so the scripture is very clear. The best example of this problem in man is best seen in the book of Ecclesiastes. In fact, if you want to turn there, I'd like for you to read along with me. Ecclesiastes, and we're going to look at chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes is a, a book that was written by Solomon when he was really struggling in his own life. And he was really trying to find meaning and purpose in his life. And he tried to find uh, a way to fill the emptiness in his own soul. And what he does here is he gives the record of how he tried to do this. And I would say to you that every single one of us in this room have tried to do this same thing, maybe not to the extent that he did, because we don't have the resources that he did, but we've all tried to do the same thing. But Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. Let me just read them to you. Solomon says, I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom. Now think about that. He's thinking that he's going to use his wisdom to guide his heart while he's gratifying himself with wine. It's not going to happen. 
and nor did it happen. And he says, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. And I made my works great. I built myself houses and I planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants. I had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and special treasures of kings and of, uh, of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers I, and delights of the sons of men and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There is no profit under the sun. Now the Hebrew word here for vanity means emptiness. And so he did all of these things and he said, it's all empty. The wine only gives emptiness in my soul. All of the houses that I built and the vineyards and the gardens that I planted, the water pools that I, I built. You can go to Israel today and still see some of the water pools that, God, that Solomon has built. They're still there today. It's an incredible thing. His water works. He said all of the possessions that he had, all of the, the silver and gold and everything that he had, he said it's all empty. So what was Solomon trying to do? He was trying to satisfy the, the spiritual vacuum that was inside him. He was trying to fill that with material things, with wine, with women, you know, 700 wives, 300 concubines. I'm telling you, this guy had a problem. And he was not satisfied. And so you think to yourself, well, that's exactly what I've done. That's exactly what you've done. You think, oh, material things. Oh, if I just had this, or if I just was there, or if I just could do this. Well, I'll tell you, there is nothing that satisfies in this life the emptiness that's inside. Nothing. Except one individual, the Lord Jesus. And we, we have come to that conclusion. And so this is one of the fundamental causes that drives people to addictive behavior. Why? Because they think that a little more will do it. Well, if I just had a little more, that will take care of it. If I just get a little higher, you know, because you all know, I mean, you, you get a little high, you got to get a little bit more high. Well, that doesn't do it for me anymore. I got to go a little, one more step. That's always the way it is. And you get this possession, and then I have to have that possession. Oh, I got to have something bigger and better. And I'm telling you, workaholics are as much caught by their own addictive behavior as anybody who uses drugs and alcohol. And I, I watch people ruin their lives trying to just get more and more. I watch it all the time. And so this is one of the causes. It's one of the fundamental causes. And it's what drives a person to obtain and to do these behaviors. Now, secondly, 
then with this emptiness inside, the power of your own sin nature will then seek to control you. Now, if you are a person who is living apart from God, you have no power of God. But this is also true for somebody who lives a superficial relationship with the Lord. They have no power either. And so what becomes the power source in their life? It's their own sin nature. So I have a spiritual vacuum inside. I have this hole inside of me, and I want to fill it with something. And then all of a sudden now I have no power to deal with the, the problem that I see, the struggle that I'm having. So now my sinful nature takes over. And that's what drives me. That's what motivates me. Now, many times I sit with people and they say to me, well, Steve, I'm just, I'm just an especially evil person. You don't know what I have done. And I go, well, all I can say to you is I've heard everything. You can't tell me anything that I haven't already heard somebody else already tell me. And I've probably done most of what you have done as well. And so, you know what? You're not an especially evil person. You're no more evil than I am. You're no more evil than anybody else. Your sin nature is driving you forward and motivating you to take the actions you are. And so that is something that a person has to come to grips with. They have to say, this is my nature to do this, to do what I do. Now, if you live apart from God, you have no power. If you live in a superficial relationship with the Lord, you have no power. You have to come into a relationship with the Lord or your sin nature will rule you. Now, for Christians that are trying to get free and stay free from whatever addictive behavior they have, I tell them the most and the most important aspect is you've got to seek the Lord. You've got to seek the Lord like you have never sought him before because that is your solution. But if you are playing with the Lord, if you're playing games with him, it's not going to happen. You are never going to stay free you will go back. Why? Because your sinful nature is stronger than your will to resist it. Remember this. Romans six nineteen says this. Paul said, Just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Now, notice what Paul says there. He's saying, I want you to present yourself to God as a slave to righteousness and holiness, just like you presented yourself to sin and to iniquity. Just like you gave yourself over to your sin nature, I want you to give yourself over to the Lord. But notice what he says there. He says, as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. You see, it always leads you to more. There's, there's something worse down the road. It says in Romans 7, verse 18, Paul said, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. So Paul is saying there, look, in my own life I came to this conclusion. In me, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. And I have a will to do what's right, what's good, but I, don't, I can't find the power to do it. You see, that's my problem. That's your problem. That's everybody's problem. We want to do what's right, but how do we do what's right? Where is the power? If I don't have the power of God, the power of my sin nature will win. It will win every single time. 
I have my only answer is the power of God. And the longer I resist God's solution and God's power controlling me, yielding to that, the worse it becomes. Now, this is what Paul said in Ephesians 4, verse 22. He says, You put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Now, the, the little phrase there, grows corrupt, is in the present tense in the Greek. It means that it's continuously growing corrupt. More corrupt and more corrupt. It just gets worse and worse. That's why Paul said, put it off. You have to reject what your sinful nature is attempting to drive you to do. And you have to yield to the new man, that new nature, via the Holy Spirit who has come to reside in you. Because this is the struggle that we are all in. You see, in Isaiah 9, 18, it says that wickedness or sin is like a fire. It, a fire is not satisfied with consuming just a little. The fire has to consume everything until it is stopped. If you don't stop it, it will keep burning. You guys have had some incredible forest fires here up in your hills in the last few years. And you know what I'm talking about. Those firefighters either stop it or it just keeps on burning. I mean, last summer, gosh, we had one that burned a couple of months on the other side of the, the range here. And it just went on and on and on. And so your sin nature is like a fire and it will consume everything unless you put the fire out. You must put off the old man if you're going to put the fire out and you must put on the new man, that new nature. And so the third cause of addictive behaviors is one that many times people just don't understand. And I have come to realize this, this third cause just over the years, watching people get free and then they go right back into their addictive behavior, whatever it is. And I sa would sit there and say to myself, what is going on here? This person has walked with the Lord for the last couple of years. They seem like they were doing good, but what happened? Why did, they, why did they return? Why did they go back? Why, why, why? You see, that's the question you have to answer. Why? Well, I can tell you the reason why, and I can show you in the scripture why. I've seen this over and over again. The woman at the well, she tried to cover up the emptiness in her own soul and her sinful nature controlled her, and thus she had five husbands. And so she was using men to fill the hole inside her. But they, they didn't satisfy her. Jesus said, five husbands you've had, and the man you're with right now, you're not even married to. And so, you see, the issue is, there is one of the most powerful examples, this woman. I mean, and what did Jesus say about her? And what did he speak to her about? He talked to her about the thirst that was inside of her soul. You see, the emptiness, that vacuum that's inside, that's what he's talking about. It's a thirst that says something has got to fill and satisfy the inside of me. What is it going to be? And so you have to ask yourself, what, what has it been with you? And if you say, well, it's men, or it's women, or it's a drug, or it's alcohol, or it's, you know, the... I mean, I, I talked to a guy that, I mean, he was into every extreme sport that you could imagine. 
And that was his addiction. It was, and ultimately, uh, it almost killed him. But he had to have the rush. That, that was his thing. I, I, gotta, I gotta feel that adrenaline, man. I gotta feel it every week. I gotta go do something. I gotta jump out of a plane. I gotta jump off of a cliff. I gotta do something. And he was in one sport after another. And I said, dude, there is something driving you. What is it? What, what is this thing inside you? People who gamble. It's that, it's the high that they get. And if you know somebody who's a compulsive gambler, you know what I'm talking about. It, it's a high that they get. It's the same high as you get off a drug. But it's the thirst that's driving them inside. In John 4, 13, Jesus said, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. That's, a, that's an affirmative. Not might thirst again. Will thirst again. And he's using a simple play on words. He's using physical water to describe the spiritual thirst that was within this woman. Because he turned the whole issue around and began to talk to her about the living water that he would give to her. That out of her innermost being would flow this river of living water that would satisfy her once and for all. She wouldn't have to go try and find it in men. If you try and satisfy your emptiness any other way, you will always thirst again. And so my encouragement is let somebody satisfy the thirst in your soul. Now, let me give you some just some examples of how this thirst in a person's soul is looks a little different in different individuals. This is why I say in this particular case, these issues are different in every person's life. There are issues that a person covers up as a Christian. They never get to these issues. I, we had a fellow in our church here a few years ago, and he had been sober for, gosh, a couple of years, and all of a sudden, he just took a nosedive, and he was, he was in jail, and you know, he got into a bar fight, and I mean, it was, it was a bad scene. His wife called me, I, I went and visited him, and, and I said, what's the matter? I said, what made you do this? Why did you do this? I asked him the question. He goes, I don't know why. I don't know. I said, there's a reason. I said, what were you thinking? What was going through your head? And he goes, well, I don't know. I was just angry. I was really uptight. I was just, and I go, well, what were you angry at? I don't want to tell you, I, you know, and he just, he was all over the planet trying to get away and squirm out of what, of telling me what it was. And I said, I'm not leaving here until you tell me what this is all about. Well, all of a sudden, he put it out on the table. He goes, you know, Steve, years ago, I was sexually abused as a little boy for several years by an individual, and I hate him. And I, I, I'd like to kill him. And as I watched this guy, I saw his face. It just, it was like, he would look like walking death. I could, if blood could shoot out of somebody's eyes, I mean, his, his neck turned all red. He started to sweat. I mean, this guy was very resentful. And if he had an opportunity, he would have done bodily harm to this guy. And I said, dude, you've got to deal with this. You've got to address this resentment in your heart. And I said, you've got to forgive. And he goes, I am not forgiving him. And I said, well, what, what about all the Bible studies you've heard all these years about forgiveness? And he goes, well, I'll forgive everybody else, but not this guy. And he was covering it up the whole time. And I said, brother, I said, you are not going forward until you address this issue in your life. And I said, I can guarantee you, you'll, 
you'll get clean and sober for a while. But I said, you'll go back again. And sure enough, he did. The next time we got to sit down, I said, brother, are you ready to deal with this? And at that time, he said, okay, you're right. I got to deal with this. And he forgave the guy. And I gave him several ways that he had to resolve this issue. Another individual that I counseled here just not too long ago, he would do fine for long periods of time and then back into drugs and alcohol again. And I, I said to him, there's something wrong. There's a reason. What's going on? This guy was not resentful. He was guilty. And I, and I said, you've, you've got some stuff that you're covering up. So what is it? And then he began to explain to me all the people that he had burned and that he had lied, the people that he had lied to. And at that particular time, he was AWOL from the service. And so he was a deserter. And I said, brother, I said, you got some major turnaround here to do. And I said, unless you want to deal with these issues, I said, you are never going to get your life right. I don't care how, much, how many Bible verses you know, how much you go to church. You go to church seven nights a week, and it's not going to change. I said, you've got to deal with this stuff because this is sin, and it's sin that's being covered up. And you're not addressing the real issues that are underlying that you're covering up here, and they will come back and get you. And finally, the guy said, you know what? He said, you're right. I've got to deal with this stuff. I've never wanted to deal with it. And I said, okay, the first thing you need to do is you need to go turn yourself in and take, take your medicine. Throw yourself on the mercy of your commanding officer and ask for mercy. And God gave this guy mercy. He did no jail time, no brig time. And got put back into his unit he went and spent his year in Afghanistan because that's where he didn't want to go. And he's just returned just a short time ago. And the guy has gotten his life squared away. He's gone back and he's asked forgiveness of the people that he burned. He's sought to restore and make restitution to the people that he burned and robbed and ripped off. I said, you got to get every single one of these things squared away and get them right. And he said, I'll do it. I'll do whatever it takes. And he went back and he did it. I have met multitudes of people who are, they're, they're living under somebody else's standard of righteousness. They're living be under their own standard of perfectionism. They're, they're caught by some aspect in their own personal life. And they're not dealing with it, which then ruins their personal relationship with the Lord, and then they go back to their addiction. So these are the three simplest, most basic causes of why a person has an addictive behavior and why they go back to those behaviors after they come to Christ. And so it is essential that you see there's a spiritual vacuum inside and you cannot satisfy it any other way than the Lord Jesus. You have a sinful nature that's stronger than your will to resist it. You need a power greater than your own sin nature. And you need to obey the voice of the Lord. You gotta do what he tells you to do in every aspect of your life because that is my next point. That's what true discipleship is all about. So let's talk about solutions. The solution is simple, but it's not easy. There's a difference. The solution is so simple. It is come to Christ, receive him, and obey him. Become his disciple. It's redemption and discipleship. That is the answer. But that's not an easy thing to do. It's, it's a lifetime 
uh, issue that you have to deal with. It's growing constantly in your relationship with him. But God provides the same solution for every sin, every struggle. It's the same, it's the same answer. It's no different. So even if you don't have an addictive behavior here, and you're just struggling with some area of sin in your life, it's the same answer. It's redemption and discipleship. Because we're all the same. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13, Paul said, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Now the way of escape is the truth that I just shared with you just a minute ago. That's the way of escape. And that is the only way of escape. Redemption and discipleship. If you don't want that way of escape, then disregard everything that I've said to you tonight because it's not going to work. You will not get free. The only solution is that which he has provided. And that means that you have to die. You have to die to self. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I've got to deny me. That's how I put off the old man and put on the new man. That's how you do it. You deny yourself. You see, self is on the throne. That's my struggle. That's your struggle. And that's what leads. You see, not dealing with some of those things that people cover up, that's self, you see. Self that saying, I, I'm not going to let the Lord deal with that. No, that door is closed, Jesus. You can't touch that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to do as I please there. And he says, no, there's no going forward unless you give me the key to that door. I have to come in there. It's contact with God's truth, contact with God's power. God's truth is what leads you to his power. So this particular study is what's going to lead you in the truth that will help you to find the power that you're looking for. In John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said this. He said, if you abide in my word, and you, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, usually we only quote that last part of that particular verse. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But that's not the whole verse, and that's not the whole truth. It's taken out of its context. Because just knowing the truth does not make you free. Let me read it again. If you abide in my word, or abide in my truth, you are my disciples indeed. You see, people who try and cover up those issues, they're not letting the truth come and deal with those issues in their life. A person that's got a superficial relationship with the Lord, they are not abiding in his truth and in his word. Abiding is a word that basically means to remain in or to obey. If you, if you look at it in the context of, of John 15, where Jesus talks about abiding in him, at the very end of that whole section there in John 15, verses uh, 1 through 10, you'll see there that he says, If you abide in my word, then you will keep my commands. So you've got to obey him. That's discipleship, you see. And so that's where growth takes place. So when I'm obeying him, I will know the truth, and the truth will make me free. Why? Because I'm obeying it. It's that simple. In John 4:14, 4, there Jesus said, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him 
will never thirst. Wow. I mean, that's a powerful statement. That is a powerful promise. If you are drinking of that living water, you will never thirst. So when you sense that emptiness inside, you say to yourself, I must not be drinking. I must not be coming by faith to have contact with the living God. Because if I am, that's where I'm going to have that satisfied. Jesus said, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So this is something that becomes in you, a fountain that springs up to life. It's not something that happens just like that. It's something that, it's a process. As you surrender more, he takes over more. As you give him complete control, he will take control and he will empower you. Now, last, Titus chapter 2, verse 14. <clears throat> this, I believe, is probably one of the most important verses of Scripture in reference to this issue of addictive behaviors. There it says that Christ gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now notice that both redemption and discipleship are in that one verse. He says, he gave himself for us that he might redeem us, that he might loose us from the penalty and the power of sin so that we might be able to come to him in the first place. And then he says, redeem us from every lawless deed. Now, that is not only the sins that you commit, but it's the struggles that you have. Every lawless deed. So whatever your particular addictive behavior is, it's included in that every lawless deed. That's what he came to redeem you from, to loose you from. And then the discipleship part of this verse and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That's the transformation. That's the sanctification part of the Christian life. It's purifying me, changing me. Why? Because I have contact with the truth of God. I have contact with the power of God, which changes me. And you know, I can say to, to you very simply, without the Lord, without his power, I would be involved in every addictive behavior I used to be involved in and worse. I probably wouldn't even be alive today because that's, that's where I was headed. I know where I was headed and it was not a good place. So I am absolutely sure, apart from the grace of God, the power of God, the truth of God, I could not be here tonight. So I encourage you, this is the solution. Redemption and discipleship. And that's what the lessons that I've written in this series are all about. It will help you to understand this is what real redemption is all about, what real discipleship is all about. I pray and I encourage you, each one of you, you know, come to each one of these studies and work through these, these lessons because the Lord will change your life. He will dramatically, radically save you. That is his promise right here. He came to redeem you from every lawless deed and he wants to purify you and make you a special person that he is using in this in these last days. So may the Lord bless you and may he use you. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, I ask tonight that you would just pour out your spirit on each and every heart here. Lord, I pray that you would bring 
Lord, just that, that sense, that, that rationale, that understanding, that wisdom to convince every heart here that these are the most basic truths that will set their lives free. Redemption, discipleship. Lord, we, we ask you to, to come and transform us. Fill us with your power. Lord, we want to be set free from every lawless deed. Lord, I pray that you would just help us, each one of us, to come to you daily, to, to allow you to satisfy the thirst within us. Lord, you are the only one who can. Lord, we believe you to do that. Set us free from the power that drives us, that motivates us inside to sin. And Lord, motivate us to righteousness. And Father, we pray that you would take every area of our lives, control it. Lord, we want to be honest with you about those issues. We want to let them go. Lord, we don't want to withhold one thing from your touch, from your transforming power. Lord, forgive us, strengthen us, and empower us, Lord, to serve you the way you have created us to. Lord, the way you intend. Lord, we know you have a plan for each and every one of us here, a good plan. Lord, fulfill it in us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.